you, you can holler, you can applaud, you can scream, you can do anything you want. I can't hear you anyway. <laughs> Welcome to Salt Lake Dirt. I'm your host, Kyler Bingham. Today on the show, I welcome a real Hollywood legend. Nancy Olson Livingston is here to talk about her memoir called A Front Row Seat, an intimate look at Broadway, Hollywood, and the age of glamour. Nancy is probably best known for her role as Betty Schaefer in the classic Billy Wilder film. Incredible stuff. Um, I love the book. It was surreal talking with her. There really aren't many from that time period left to to share their firsthand experiences. Um, So I'll make sure there are links to pick up a copy of the book. You can get it all over online. Amazon, of course. I believe Larry Edmonds in Hollywood still has signed copies. I will put a link to that as well. Um, Here we go. Nancy Olson Livingston talking about her memoir, A Front Row Seat. Thanks for listening. So yeah, I'm here right now with Nancy Olson Livingston. And we are here to talk about her brand new book, A Front Row Seat, an intimate look at Broadway, Hollywood, and the age of glamour. Thank you so much, Nancy, for taking the time to speak with me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Well, I I really enjoyed the book. And um, I think the, the funny thing is, so I'm a high school teacher by day. And I teach a film class. Sunset Boulevard is one of the one of the classic films that I that I show students, and they are still engaged with it. So in in 2022, that's that's it's pretty amazing to uh, have a it teenager <laughs> engage with a film, or to have yeah. honestly any movie, even like a recent movie. The attention span, uh, you know, is shorter than it's ever been, but. You know, so many of my students are really drawn into this film and um, very interested. So I should, you know, say first off, that's where probably you have you've had such an amazing career, but that's where pro- people probably know you from is Betty Schaefer in Sunset Boulevard. Um, yeah, I had been looking you up a year or two ago, and I I saw um, that you were still living in in Beverly Hills, and and I thought to myself. I can't believe there isn't a book on her. Uh, so it was it was almost <laughs> like I put that out into the world. I was so excited to see this. And, um, you know, I I read right through it. I, I guess, um, first off, I'll just say I love the book. And then I'm really curious about how, like, how did you decide it was time to release a book? To, um, you know, how long did this take you to accomplish this this large feat of just recounting your life? First of all, I I have never considered myself a writer. I do remember getting an A plus on an A on an A essay that I had written in the first year of college at the University of Wisconsin, and I was so amazed. And the the professor said, "You are a, a very gifted writer," and I thought, "Really? <laughs> <laughs> that is not how I think of myself." But anyway, um, what happened was that. My first husband died. I have two beautiful, wonderful daughters and grandchildren from them both. And um, it, that was in 1986. And they they were living in New York, and, and I was here. We had all been living in New York before. And they kept me every day up to date about his prog- progress or lack of it in the hospital. Mm-hmm. And they were very upset, which I understood. And the morning that they di- that he died, they called me, and I sat down and wrote them a letter. And I worked on the letter a little bit and uh, put it away for several years. But in it, it does create the possibility of the formation of a life story and a book. And... I decided to pick it up and try and give them as honestly as I could the story of being a human being who had an enormous amount of good luck, bad luck, (laughs) happiness, joy, tragedy, sadness, 
everything that we all go through are if you live as long as I have. And it's inevitable. I don't care who you are. And that fascinated me. And I thought, well, I'm going to write it down. And I started. And I wanted to talk about my childhood and about growing up, my parents, and the world that was so different mm -hmm. so long ago. There weren't that many people in the world. <laughs> right. And it's so that life was not quite as pressured in the same way that it is today. Um, and anyway, I started it and put it away literally for several years and then picked it up again and kept going. And I thought, well, I better keep going. And then I put it down because something events would happen, life would happen. And I thought, oh, gosh, I can't deal with that right now. And then I'd pick it up again. And I got to the end where, at the point where book one ends the day that I marry my second husband, Alan Livingston. And it was a perfect opportunity for me to say, well, wait a minute. I could do a book two, for all in one book, of course, mm -hmm. my life, but it could be a letter to my son the day that his father died. That's how long it took. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote that letter, and that got me filled with memories and what life and its amazing turns and twists and what it does, not only in the world, but to one's own life. And so I kept going. And I had an odd way of writing. I would write everything in longhand, even though I was I typed everything in college and mm -hmm. typed endless letters to my parents when I was at UCLA and they were still in Wisconsin. And um, but I hadn't really used the typewriter. And, and now we had uh you know, the, um, what do you call it? I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, yeah your, um, your your desktop, your computer, your laptop, <laughs> your, the, your tablet. The laptop. <laughs> and the, the computer is what I'm trying to remember. <laughs> and um, so what I did, because I've got this large screen on the computer, I wrote in longhand several chapters. And then I would hire a young woman who was who you, you know I paid by the hour who was just a, did the the typing, mm -hmm. and I sat next to her looking at the screen of the computer, and I would read out loud what I had written, so that I not only heard myself tell the story, but I watched it being actually written on the screen, so that I had both to f compute. And I would then hear myself say something or read something and say, no, 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 that's not right. No, that, that's not quite it. And I would then correct it. And that was the way I wrote. And it worked very well. I mean, she would come one day a week for at the end right. when I was really just said, I've got to now finish this. And she would spend the day with me and we would, I would, you know, there it was. And then I sent it to several publishers who said, we really don't know what to do with this. Mm. And uh, one of them said, you know, you don't have to tell us what you wore 70 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, that's what I wanted to tell you. That's what I loved about it. I love the detail like that. That's what was so beautiful about it. <laughs> I said, when you, when I describe walking into the room, I want you to see me mm -hmm. at a time where people do not wear what I was wearing <laughs> then. And it shocks me, actually. <laughs> Well, and I lived in, in New York City, and also when, when Alan Livingston and I married, and he brought me to California, to Los Angeles, uh, he I thought maybe we should buy a little house at the beach and have that as a little extra getaway. Uh -huh. And he said, no. He said, we're going to look for an apartment in New York. <laughs> you know, just a nice, small, two-bedroom apartment. The children can come back and forth with us to visit. And but we can establish 
a residence in New York because that was important for his work right, right. and what he was doing. And so I went and my two daughters were there. So, I mean, it was perfect and I knew it, but I can tell you that I woke up in the morning and I thought, well, I'm going to walk over to Bergdorf Goodman and see what they have having just arrived from California, but I would not put on sneakers and a pair of, you know, jeans and walk over to Bird Dark Goodman. <laughs> I put myself together. I and I, I absolutely love that. That's uh that's wonderful. I'm so um oh no continue. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just I love the detail like that. That's just amazing. Well you know, Judy Krantz read it before she died and she said, Oh Nancy, I just love to hear what you wore <laughs> No, it's wonderful. I mean, I think what well, you, you mentioned, I love the way the book was broken up into um, the two chunks and just it really grabbed my attention from the beginning. That, Like you, you already talked about the letter that you wrote your daughters and what a beautiful thing uh, to receive from a, a mother. And it's like it's like this book is, um, you know, a letter to your children, to your grandchildren, great grandchildren and. Um, and then we, as the audience, you know, fans of of, of film and um, you know Hollywood, we get to kind of take a peek and see this incredible life that unfolded over time. Um, right. it, it's just it's just incredible. Well, by the way, to get back to Sunset Boulevard, the, the one you know, old clothes, old cars. Those were your clothes, big. right, in Sunset Boulevard. I wore my own clothes, right? Right. But- <laughs> Because Billy Wilder wanted me. He wanted Nancy Olson. He did not want a starlet from somewhere else. He wanted somebody from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, doctor's daughter, an aspiring writer. And you had to believe when I spoke and expressed myself in the as I do in the script mm-hmm. that you would believe that that is possibly something that I really – wanted to be and could be and the thing about the script two things one or a hundred things (laughs) but basic things first of all you it was designed to be on a big screen the best way to look at this is if it's ever shown in your area and you want your kids to see it or your friends or whatever you that's how to look at it because it's a big theme it's big performances, and it was designed to be on the big screen. That's one aspect. The other thing that is absolutely the power of this movie is that it tells the truth. Right. And it exposes the truth of everyone. <laughs> My character is an ambitious young woman who wants to be recognized as a writer. And I think that Joe Gillis, Bill Holden's character, can be the one to help me make that happen. Mm. In the meantime, as an opportunist that I am, I fall in love with a man who has already sold his soul for survival. And what this film does, it reveals the truth about everything, particularly the motion picture industry. It's a business. Movie stars were commodities, are commodities. Especially at that time, Marilyn Monroe being the perfect example of someone who was totally destroyed by this. But she was already a destroyed human being, as I point out. Right. In the book. Before she, she allowed herself to be exploited. And then in the book, you you mentioned like when, when this came out or before or soon before it was coming out, um, some of the you know studio heads exec, executives were unhappy with this film. Like how oh my Billy God. Wilder, how could how you could make you this? Do this to us? Right, you're exposing us. <laughs> and Billy's attitude was, "Excuse me," but he said, "Go fuck yourself." <laughs> I love it <laughs> because Billy. Billy, by the way, was born and raised in Nazi Germany. His right. mother and his grandmother were murdered in Auschwitz. Right. I mean, uh, he was doing all kinds of things just to survive in Germany, and he somehow got out 
and he had this gift and talent, and he had an opening, and he grabbed it, and off he went. But uh, he was a very special person who had that absolute sadness behind him, Mm -hmm. and that was a part of him. And he wasn't interested in anything but the truth. Mm. Well, just like, yeah, I mean, That's, this film is incredible. And, his, his, you know, we all know his other films are, you know, he... They've, Double Indemnity, oh which is a long time ago. I love I mean, that, that movie. That, that, yeah. That's, that's, you know. And now, one thing, just for your listeners, is, well, what happened to you? Well, I made four pictures. <laughs> Oh, I did Canadian Pacific with Randolph Scott, who was as old as my father. It was ridiculous. And I played an Indian, <laughs> right? half Canadian, a half Indian girl. And I called the studio and said, I'm a Scandinavian with blue eyes. It's in color. Do I really look like an Indian? <laughs> they said, they want you. You're going to do it. And they lent me to 20th. The good news is that it was made in the summer. I could go back to school in the fall. And back to the university. And also, I had, I knew how to, what the camera did. Mm -hmm. I knew that there were close ups and there were long shots and there were action and there was cut and there was preparation and there was a, there was a, a routine. Right. And therefore, when I did Sunset, the second film, I was a little more prepared as to how to, manage all that anyway in those days it was six days a week i was at the studio at seven seven to nine two hours of hair and makeup arrived on the set in this four-story dark sound stage when the door closed behind you it was you could that's it you were in period and you were with a makeup man and a hairdresser and a wardrobe person and a an assistant director who was telling you what the, what was going to happen and you were there until six o'clock right and that is not a life for a 20 year old and a 21 year old mm-hmm. and I wasn't able to finish college which my parents were more upset about anything they'd rather have me finish college than be a movie star <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess that's most parents, right? <laughs> right. And anyway, I also, how many women stars that I looked at around me were happily married, had families, children, husband? Probably not a lot, I would think, I would guess. No. I mean, I am a Midwestern doctor's right. daughter. Sorry. <laughs> Now, I want to be with the most interesting, the brightest, most sophisticated, talented, gifted people. And when Alan Lerner asked me to marry him, wow, I wanted to be in that world. I wanted to be with that person watching him create. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, oh, go ahead. I said to Paramount, goodbye. (laughs) <laughs> and they stopped paying me, which was okay with me. Then Sunset was released, and the pressure to continue doing something was so great. I can't tell you. But So I did it every, something every once in a while. Mm-hmm. And then I did three plays on Broadway. And, and then I did uh, – I went to Disney. I thought my career was totally – I would never do any – movies ever again and I get this call from Disney and and he says you know from Walt Disney saying Nancy we need you and you know this is something I know you don't work all the time you're not interested but I think you'd be interested in joining our cast and we're spending more money than we usually do on something other than animation and uh, we would love you to have us join us and I was coming to California anyway with the children and visiting my parents, who now my father was retired and lived here, and worked at. He was immediately asked to be a clinical professor at UCLA, their new medical school, which he did. And uh, I, so I said, sure, I'll do it. 
and that was the beginning of, and then the absent-minded professor, right. which I think is one of the most fantastic movies ever made. I love that movie. Growing up, oh my goodness, I loved it. Yeah, everybody does. <laughs> Incredible. Anyway, um, that's the story of my life. <laughs> well, I mean, I encourage. Then people. I was, oh, by the by the way, excuse me, but I married Alan. But you know, Alan Lerner created. I, as I said, he was married eight times, uh, but he. I was with him during the what I described as the apex of his career. Mm, He'd oh, already yeah. written Rigadoon, which is a beautiful mm -hmm. musical, and then he wrote with me "Paint Your Wagon," the movie "Royal Wedding." And then the musical My Fair Lady, which he dedicated to me. Right, right. And then the incredible movie Gigi mm -hmm. and the score. And then he was beginning Camelot and we were divorced. Mm -hmm. So it was an absolutely wondrous experience to sit and watch that all being created. That's what's so great about the book. It, it gives the reader, we, we kind of, we get a peek of it. We get to see, and it, I just... What the process is. Right, it's incredible. And, and just how, what struck me, I know I know we got to we gotta wrap up here soon, but I, I was so struck by what a cheerleader you were <laughs> to so many uh, of the people well, around you. Well, I I was, I was definitely enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. I appreciated it. Now, I have to quickly tell you that when I met Alan Livingston, he had been the president or he had run Capitol Records and created when he came when he first started there, the Bozo the Clown and all the children's albums, sure. which whole changed the industry. Mm -hmm. And then he signed you know, Frank Sinatra was let go by Columbia saying your career is over. Alan signed him and put him with Nelson Riddle. And the, it, 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 I mean, that was the apex of his career. Yeah. And then he went to, he left Capitol, went to NBC and created Bonanza, came back to Capitol when he married me. And the first thing he did was sign the Beach Boys, the Beatles, and the band. <laughs> unreal. Unreal. <laughs> So I was entertaining the Beatles now. Right. In the book, I mean, oh my, oh, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so it, it was quite a ride, my life. <laughs> uh, well, I am going to put, uh, I'm going to make sure people have information of where they can purchase the book. Uh, I know you oh, did, please. you did an event at Book Soup uh, in, in West Hollywood recently, so I'll put yeah. um, links. They can purchase it there. They can purchase it. I believe Larry Edmonds even has signed copies of the book currently, if unless they've sold out already. But I'll I'll make sure people have that information. I know everything, but it's sold out. But it also they can they can go to uh, Amazon and just say Nancy Olson Livingston, and there it is, and they can order it. Excellent. Yeah, such a such a wonderful book. Um, I will say this, and then and then I'll let you go. One thing I loved about the book and I felt like it was just such a um it was just so it was so interesting and so readable. I loved the short chapters because it it almost felt like episodic TV where I finished a short chapter uh and then I just wanted to read the next one. So I ended up reading yeah. much more than I was planning on on any given night because you were hooking me <laughs> with each chapter. So <laughs> it was sorry. <laughs> no, it was brilliantly done. Um and I, I don't believe well, I, I haven't read a, a, a memoir quite like that before. So I just want to uh, applaud you for that. And I felt like it was just, it just read so oh. fast for me. It was such an enjoyable read and um, it, it kept me hooked the whole time. Um, I was well, so, by the way, I have, I, I have stories that I had did not write about. Some I wrote and I figured they were just too incendiary. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to touch them. Sure. But then others, I mean, I had an amazing friendship with Gore Vidal and mm -hmm. amazing experiences with him. I, I didn't even talk about or write about that. I mean, I just, I could deal with what I could deal with and that was going to be it. Right. You know what I mean? Well, I, I and feel... And I'm not going to write another book. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said, "Why don't you 
had another one, Nancy, with all those stories. Oh I, no, 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 no. That's for that's for you, right? You can you can keep that keep those, and I think you you've been so generous. I'll keep those stories to myself. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> you've been so generous to to even write this one. So, um, wow, what an honor to talk talk to you for a little bit today um i wish you happy holidays coming up we're right before and you too and week. a very happy new year absolutely uh nancy olson livingston the book is a front row seat nancy thank you so much and thank you bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.